I'm a quantitative marine ecologist, kind of st fishery stock assessment scientist, or um, as my girlfriend likes to call me, a fish counter. I cut my teeth uh, studying lobster and cod in the Gulf of Maine um, at the University of Maine, but now I've kind of switched focus to a more broad perspective of different things that are happening in the ocean. And much of my current work is actually focused on China and kind of figuring out how to deal with climate pollution and overfishing um, for the biggest fishery country in the world. Now, here's kind of the outline of today. I'm going to give a very broad overview, mostly of projects I've been a part of, but to kind of touch on some of the topics I think are most interesting or maybe cutting edge right now. I'm going to start with global changes in ecosystems and fisheries. Then I'm going to turn around and explore a little bit of what some of these cascading effects will mean for people. Uh, and finally, ask, I'll ask the question, can we and how should we and how will we create a future of more climate resilient fisheries? Now, there's a lot of different camps of climate change, what the ocean is going to do in the next 50 or 100 years. I tend to be of the opinion that nothing exists in a vacuum. Any of these species, whether we're looking in a fishery management context or an ecosystem approach, really none of them belong in a vacuum. They don't act on themselves. Um, these systems are dynamic, hard to predict, and they're changing really rapidly. So you guys will often read, uh, their X stock crash, this ecosystem is crashing, fisheries are losing productivity. And generally, I would explain it kind of comes like this. You have multiple causes. Maybe you take some habitat alteration, you have selective fishing on certain species or life history types in an ecosystem. You mix that with some ocean warming, and with that, some species are going to do better, some species are going to get the heck out of there, and some aren't going to do as well. This all results in the Gulf of Maine, for example, with a cod fishery that's not super great. But these are complex systems. Um, we know through a lot of examples that the combination of overfishing and climate change can categorically alter ecosystems. This cool paper from Cody uh, Sawalski in 2017 looked at the East China Sea, which similar to the Gulf of Maine is warming much faster than the global average, and considered different fishing scenarios and looked at how the composition of the ecosystem changed. And if you look at the red, that means the carrying capacity of that species decreased. And if you look at the green, that means the carrying capacity increased. And you'll see like there's a big red clump and a kind of a big green clump. The interesting thing about the green species is they tend to be faster growing uh, they tend to be kind of weedy species, but categorically what we see is this shift. And this changes fisheries, this changes markets, it changes supply chains, and it uh, supply changes uh, chains. It's pretty dramatic. Uh, this is more, I, I'm from Seattle originally, and this was part of my undergrad research. In the year of 2013, uh, Sunflower Sea Stars, Pycnopodia, as I like to call them, they experienced a catastrophic failure where in the period of about one year, they just started literally melting away. The arms would actually melt off and walk away from the rest of the sea star. And this is the biggest and fastest sea star in the world. Um, they move about three feet a minute, and they're like this big. But in the period of one year, over 99% of them died. And there's a lot of studies that followed up on this. And what we found is it was a denzovirus that had actually been in the population for well over 100 years, but had been dormant. And coinciding with a huge ocean warm blob in 2013, it set this off, and it was a waterborne pathogen, and it wiped out from California to Alaska. Different echinoderms, but specifically Pycnopodia. This is a real impact of climate change. And disease is something that I think is really underappreciated, but I think in the future is going to be a lot bigger topic of study. I was lucky to be part of this cool study that came out um, last year, looking at over 200 coral reefs. And the idea here is that under different climate scenarios and different bleaching scenarios, will the growth of coral as they grow up towards the top of the water, will that keep up with global ocean sea level rise? And the answer for almost all coral reefs we looked at, which is over 200, is no. That sea level rise is outpacing coral growth, and this can lead to eventually shading out of coral reefs, not like they needed any other problems. What I've been recently getting kind of excited about is this look at not so much have fisheries gotten bigger or smaller over time, but is more how has fisheries globally in terms of composition changed. And it's pretty darn interesting. From 1990 to 2016, 
um, there's pretty sharp contrast. I looked at, or I'm looking with a bunch of colleagues, at four different main groups. Cephalopods, squid, octopus, crustaceans, crab, shrimp, and lobster, uh, demersal marine fish, and pelagic marine fish. And what you can see is unquestionably the left two columns are increasing. You know, they're huge columns. And then you, for this fin fish, either you have decreases or small changes. A little bit more pronounced, if you look at shrimps, crabs, and lobsters, with or without China, that's China's the biggest fishing country in the world, again, so I included both, um, you see pretty much a one-way trip. Landings are increasing. And squid, same kind of story. Globally, we're seeing the rise of mid-trophic, kind of middle of the food chain generalists. What these species have in common is they tend to grow pretty quickly, though there's definitely variation. Uh, they tend to be able to move around and they tend to be able to eat a lot of different things. And when the world around you is changing, it's really helpful if you're flexible. So this is a cool case study, and it's, a, it's in press, I think, in Ecology and Evolution by my colleague Christy uh, right now. But on coastal Norway, similar to the Gulf of Maine, we've seen cod, Atlantic cod decline in recent decades. But because the water has been warming, it's facilitated ascent Decreased predation in warming water has facilitated edible crab to move their way up the coast to where they were never in high numbers. And similarly, from the north side, it's facilitated uh, red king crab to kind of come down. And this actually has to do with sea urchins as well. It's kind of interesting. When these crab are coming up and down, sea urchins are their first prey. It's really awesome, and they don't really have a lot of predators. So when the sea urchins are gone, you get kelp forests. And Norway is having caddis like cascading effects of its coastal marine ecosystems just because of this. And what I think is absolutely amazing is if you take this photo or you take this figure and plot it with the Gulf of Maine, Atlantic cod catches are the you know, same species. You see remarkably similar trends where even the bump in cod is similar. That's probably driven to a large extent by large climatic issue, uh, oscillations. And you see crustaceans, whether it's crab or lobster, kind of following the same trend. So across the North Atlantic, climate change is absolutely ridiculous. And it's, it is so remarkable to me that you're seeing the same trends here. I'm just so excited. Um, <laughs> so the thing that hasn't really been touched on so far today is food security. Uh, over 3 billion people depend on you know, some kind of seafood as a major protein source. This paper uh, by Golden et al. from just down the road in 2016 um, looked at that and projected how fisheries may change um, by 2050. And what they found is that 850 million people could be nutrition deficient just based on the declines in fisheries by 2050, which is quite remarkable. So I really liked this paper and decided to take this data set and dig a little bit my own and ask for these four different kinds of seafood, and they're somewhat broad, how does nutrition compare? And I, this is just a small sample of it. So I took yield, percentage yield, so like what percentage of X organism is meat, and then I took the caloric and nutritional content of that meat. And when you combine those together, what you find is that there's some pretty large differences. Um, crustaceans compared to pelagic fish per volume are only giving you about 40% of the calories. So as the world's catch composition is changing, the caloric and nutritional composition is changing as well. So with the rise of crustaceans and some of these other really expensive food, it kind of is signaling there's a shift towards luxury food. And unfortunately, in some cases, as we see in the Gulf of Maine or we see in Canada, often this degraded state where we've remo removed a bunch of predators is a lot more valuable. For example, Atlantic Canada from 1990 to 2016 right before the big Newfoundland cod crash that I'm sure everyone has heard about. Since then, total landings are down about 50%. At the same time, the value corrected for inflation has increased about 90%. And 84% of this is from lobster. So we talk about the collapse of fisheries in Canada, and we really are catching half as much, but it's worth twice as much. Uh, this has huge socioeconomic implications. Some communities, lobster and communities, are probably going to be doing much better, and this can aid in things like economic development, but it might not mean that for everyone, i.e. if you're a cod fisherman. 
So one of the problems with this emerging kind of high, high uh, value fishery is that it might be providing the wrong kinds of incentives. If there's a bunch of gold sitting out in the water, it's not unreasonable that a lot of people are going to go after it. And you know, you already have a semi-degraded state. This may incentivize over-harvest over and over-dependence and affect social re resilience. And what I mean here is, say we have plan A. We're going to fish cod, large predatory fish. OK, we fished them out. The climate has changed. Now we're to plan B. We have invaluable invertebrates, such as lobster or something like that. We fish those hard. They're worth a lot of money. What's plan C? This is one of the problems that people thinking about global fisheries are really facing right now because the, most of the bad externalities of overfishing and climate change are going to be realized in the developing world. And if you have a place that is highly dependent on income from, from fisheries, Plan C can be pretty darn scary, but hard to disincentive, uh, disincentivize. So this all leads back to what we have in front of us. How can we manage marine ecosystems and fisheries for climate resilience? This is a question that people are really starting to buzz about. There's issues in, in the last month, I've probably seen five or six articles talking about this. It's a really hot topic, and it's not, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. The first thing I would say is you need to understand the system. That includes every kind of monitoring. If you're plankton monitoring, fisheries monitoring, just, e just random ecologists, we need to understand the systems better so we can maybe predict how they're going to change. This will allow us to preserve its form and function. And to do this, it's crucial that we are deliberately adaptive with our management. Again, there's no one size fits all. We have to be on top of it. And with that, I thank you all for listening. Thank you.